Welcome back, scholars. This is the third video for intermolecular forces, and this one's going to look at interactions between or involving polar molecules. So the first video was how do you know whether bonds are polar and molecules are polar? The second video was about dispersion forces and the intermolecular forces between nonpolar molecules. Now we're coming back to polar molecules. And remember, in polar molecules, there are permanent dipoles and that a dipole is a separation of charge, and that these separations in charge are caused by the greater pool on electrons that the higher electronegativity atoms have. So in HF, the fluorine has the highest electronegativity. It strongly pulls on the electrons from the hydrogens, creating a partial negative charge on the fluorine and a partial positive charge on the hydrogen. Because those charges are always present, those charges, opposite charges, are attracted to each other on neighboring molecules. And these dipoles tend to line up when these molecules are in the liquid or the solid phase. They may not point perfectly in parallel directions, but the negative part of the dipole will point towards another positive end of a different dipole. Water and ammonia are also examples of these. Of course, in water and ammonia, those dipoles will be weaker within the individual molecules. And so the strength of attraction between those molecules is also weaker. So if you looked at the boiling point for ammonia compared to the boiling point for water, the boiling point for ammonia is, um, would not, you would not predict that it would be as high based on the intermolecular forces of dipole-dipole alone. Of course, then the ammonia is a little bit larger, so it does have stronger dispersion forces. But um, in terms of the dipole-dipole force, the water is stronger than the ammonia, and the HF is stronger than the water. If we look at just dipole-dipole, of course, ammonia, water, and HF are polar, whereas CH4 is not. So we would expect their boiling points to be higher. In fact, if we look at the second set here of elements. This is going to be silicon tetrahydride. This one would be germanium tetrahydride. And we would see something similar as we look at these other neighboring elements. So this dot here would be pH3 or phosphine. The red would actually be the um, SH2, which is actually written as H2S, which would be hydrogen sulfide gas. But when it reacts with water, that's what turns into hydrosulfuric acid. And then the green one here would be HCl. The reason why these go like this, even though HCl is a little bit more polar, this has to do also with the number of electrons and the sizes of the molecules. And so there's kind of a sweet spot there with the group 16 binary hydrides where they're more polar and so they have stronger dipole-dipole uh, and they have higher boiling points, but they're also larger so they have stronger dispersion forces. When you go down to HCl, HCl has slightly stronger dipole-dipole, but is also a much smaller molecule, and so the dispersion forces are weaker. So remember, when we look at boiling point, we're really seeing the sum of all of the intermolecular forces at play. So if we take a look at the trends here that we see so far, and these trends are both mostly going kind of in this direction, and we would maybe expect the water and the ammonia and the HF to be somewhere in that range. In reality, where they are is much, much higher. And you may recall from when we talked about intermolecular forces in biology that the reason why is because these molecules have hydrogens attached to oxygen, fluorine, and nitrogen. And that should be ringing a bell. 
And that bell that you should be thinking of or that what it, this should be reminding you of is the hydrogen bonding that can occur between these molecules. So remember, hydrogen bonding is a very, very special type of dipole-dipole intermolecular force. It is not an actual bond like we've been discussing with the covalent bonds. It is still an interaction between electrons and charges, but the hydrogen bond is not in the molecule itself. The hydrogen bond is between molecules. So this is a hydrogen bond. This is a hydrogen bond. This is a hydrogen bond. And these dashed lines that are drawn over here with the methanol, where you can't see what they're connecting to, they're trying to show you that there are additional hydrogen bonds there. So remember to have hydrogen bonding, you have to have a hydrogen, which in these ball and stick models is usually represented by a white or a very light gray color. The oxygens are represented by a red, and that hydrogen has to be attached to an oxygen, nitrogen, or a fluorine, and that hydrogen that is attached to that nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine interacts with another nitrogen, oxygen, or a fluorine. So if these two images here, the acetone is the bottom molecule. This is the acetone. This is the water. And we can see that these two different molecules can still interact through hydrogen bonding, even though the acetone on its own does not have hydrogen bonds. In fact, those of you who are familiar with nail polish remover should be familiar with acetone. And one of the reasons why acetone works well is because it does not form hydrogen bonds. It has or on its own, but it can accept hydrogen bonds from other things and it has different dispersion forces compared to water. That's really for the next video. Within methanol on its own, we also have hydrogens in methanol that are attached to oxygens, and that hydrogen that's attached to an oxygen is interacting with another nearby oxygen. And so this is really the key with hydrogen bonding. I feel like you guys got a really good handle on this by the end of biology. And so if we take a look at a couple of these molecules, these are all about the same size. Notice they all have about the same molar mass. Even though molar mass is not truly what we wanna be thinking of, it does give us a general idea of size. Similar molar masses are going to have similar sizes. In fact, if we look at the number of carbons, even though ethane has two carbons and these others only have one, the oxygen in the formaldehyde and the methanol is about the same size as another carbon would be. The hydrogens are smaller, and so we don't typically count those when we're trying to think about the size of the molecule, unless that's the difference in the molecules. In these cases, they're all about the same size, the big thing we see changing is that the dipole moment goes up from ethane to formaldehyde, and we would expect the boiling point to go up, and it does. We see the dipole moment go down between formaldehyde and methanol, but the boiling point still goes up. Why is that? Well, the methanol on its own is able to form hydrogen bonds with another methanol molecule. So if I put another methanol molecule over here, This hydrogen here is able to interact with that oxygen. This hydrogen on this methanol could in fact interact with this oxygen through the formation of hydrogen bonds, which are really just a special type of intermolecular force. So in this case, even though the dipole moment goes down, the strength of that hydrogen bond forming is strong enough to push up the boiling point to make the intermolecular forces overall much stronger between methanol molecules than between formaldehyde molecules. So remember that dipole-dipole forces are attractive forces between polar molecules. Hydrogen bonds are the strongest type of dipole-dipole interaction. For them to occur, you specifically have to have a hydrogen attached to a fluorine, oxygen, or a nitrogen, and that hydrogen then interacts with another fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen from another molecule. I feel like, again, you guys had a really good handle on this from biology. 
Here were those DNA bases again that formed hydrogen bonds. This order of hydrogen bond donors and acceptors was what allows things to recognize these bases within biological cells or biological systems. And this hydrogen bonding is what holds those two DNA strands together. We did look at this slide before as well in biology. Um, if you're looking at this and you have a question like this where you're supposed to rank the compounds, you can certainly look at these formulas the way they're written out. These are called condensed structural formulas. They're trying to show you the units in each of these molecules, and they're trying to show you what's attached to what. So there's a CH3 unit, and I put the hydrogens on the left side because they can't bond to anything else. And then there's an OH unit. And you could think about converting each of these to Lewis structures. You could also think about converting each of these to line structures where we leave out the hydrogens. So the second molecule here is CH3, CH2, CH2, CH3. In other words, one, two, three, four carbons. And in this line structure, there are one, two, three, four carbons. So that line structure also, also represents that molecule. We could draw the same line structure for the last molecule, but at the third carbon, instead of that being a carbon, it's an oxygen. And so you label that atom, and then the fourth point would be a carbon. So we just draw another line there. Looking at these line structures, what do you recognize about their intermolecular forces? Which ones do you think would have the strongest intermolecular forces and therefore the highest boiling point? Which one would be lowest? Which one would be in between? Go ahead and think about that and pause the video. Last chance to pause the video. And so when we look at these three molecules, which you might recognize in the methanol, is that you have a hydrogen attached to an oxygen, which means that hydrogen bonding can occur. The oxygen itself is pretty electronegative, so methanol also has a pretty strong dipole. If you look at the CH3, CH2, CH2, CH3, or butane, C4H10, notice that it does not have any nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. It does not have any other electronegative elements like chlorine or bromine. And so that molecule is nonpolar, and the only intermolecular force between nonpolar molecules is dispersion forces. And even though it's a little bit bigger than the methanol, the dispersion forces in that molecule are still weak enough where that would have the weakest intermolecular forces. When we look at the last molecule, also called diethyl, or rather, sorry, excuse me, called ethyl methyl ether. Um, CH3, CH2, OCH3. Notice that has an oxygen, which is electronegative, so there would be a dipole, but that oxygen is not attached to any hydrogens. And so while that could accept hydrogen bonding from another molecule that was able to form hydrogen bonds, that molecule on its own, if it's associating with another molecule like it, is not going to be able to form hydrogen bonds. And so even though it's got a dipole, that's gonna put it in the middle in terms of intermolecular forces, and the methanol would actually have the strongest intermolecular forces. Go ahead and think about the same thing with these examples. Which of these would have the lowest and which of these would have the highest boiling points, which again would be a measure of the weakest and the strongest intermolecular forces. Last chance to pause the video. And so looking at these molecules, we see that most of these are about the same size. You can see that, sorry, I'm trying to pull up the pen. You can see that this one has two carbons, this one has two carbons, this one has a carbon and an oxygen. So those three are about the same size, but the CH4 only has one carbon. So the CH4 is the smallest molecule it's nonpolar, it's only going to have dispersion forces. So I would say that the methane would have the weakest intermolecular forces and it would have the lowest boiling point. Now the CH2O, if you draw the Lewis structure for that, 
that's our formaldehyde that has an oxygen, but that oxygen is not attached to a hydrogen, so no hydrogen bonds, but it does have a dipole. Whereas the C2H6 and the C2H4 do not have dipoles. So the formaldehyde is gonna have the strongest intermolecular forces and it would have the highest boiling point. So our next question then is which comes next? The ethane, the C2H6, or the ethene, the C2H4? If you notice, even though those have the same number of carbons, the C2H4 has fewer hydrogens, which means it's a smaller molecule, and it also has fewer electrons in that Lewis structure. And so the C2H4 would actually come next in terms of the increasing boiling point. It would be higher than the methane, but it would be lower than the ethane. So the ethene, the order here would be methane, ethene, ethane, and formaldehyde. So that's it for this video. The next video will cover some of the applications of intermolecular forces. Please join us in the discussion.